Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so excited to see you all and to welcome you to another episode of Explorer Classroom. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder and storytelling to change our world for the better. Our Explorer Classroom events connect students from all around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and lots of time for all of your questions. This fall, we've been running Explorer Classroom for ages nine to 14 on Thursdays at 10 and two Eastern, plus many more cool events you can check out on our website. I wanna give you all a quick reminder that it is almost time for our winter break. Explorer Classroom will go on winter break with all of you at the end of next week and we'll see you all again in January. But for now, we've got some awesome, very, very fun content. We've got Kevin McLean joining us. Kevin is an explorer and an ecologist who studies wildlife in the canopy of rainforests. In the tropical forests, many animals sleep and look for food or even live their entire lives way up high in the treetop. And because they're way up, way, way up above our heads, they're really difficult to study. So Kevin uses motion sensitive cameras to document the populations of mammals that are rarely seen otherwise, but are uniquely adapted to living their lives way up high in the trees. Today, he's gonna share some of his adventures and teach us a little bit about rainforest wildlife. But it's not just Kevin and I, we've got kids from all over the place joining us. So wherever you may be, Give us a cheer if you hear your state or your country or your school or your class. Today we've got Arizona and Azerbaijan and California and Canada and Florida and Illinois and Indiana and the District of Columbia and Maryland and Myanmar and North Carolina, uh, New Mexico, New York, Oregon, Texas and Wisconsin represented. We've got Koppel Middle School North. We've got the Dawa family, Freya, Glen Hills, Margot and Della, Martina, Miss Lorelei's Alders, Mr. Holiday, Mr. Lido's Great Sixers, Miss Richter's Cool Cats, Miss Walsh's Seventh Grade Science, Miss Arnone's Grade Fours, Parkview, Fallon International School, the Alders at Franciscan Montessori Earth, the Taylor family, the Toronto Virtual School District, and many, many more folks too. So if I've missed you in these shout outs, please feel free to say hi in the chat bar. We'd love to say hi back, send some good energy your way. We're so glad you're here with us. And I think for now that is more than enough for me. It is time to turn it over to Kevin McLean, our explorer for the day, for our lesson from the Rainforest Canopy. Hey, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for thanks for joining. I'm really excited to be able to talk talk with all of you a little bit about the work that I I've been doing over the last several years. Um, my name is Kevin McLean. Um, I uh, like Celeste said, I'm an ecologist. I study the interactions between animals and their environment, um, and that environment for me, as we've talked about, is. Uh, the rainforest canopy. So when you go into a forest, a tropical forest, a rainforest, or, or any other kind of forest, wherever you live, you'll notice that you know it's a very three-dimensional environment. You walk, we walk through on the ground, but there are all these layers higher and higher and higher. And so that those those layers that are above the ground, above where we spend our time usually. Um, are uh, one of one of those layers is called the canopy, and that's that's usually one of the top layers where the the crowns of different trees meet each other. Um, and this is a really really important habitat um, for for uh, a lot of wildlife. Um, it's also where a lot of the photosynthesis happens, where trees are are making energy out of the sun. Um, so it's a really important part of the ecosystem, but it's also um, it's also a part of the forest that can be really difficult to study because as you can see right here, access can be very, very tricky. So um, I, I use a lot of different climbing techniques to get myself up into the trees. Um, and then once I'm up there, I will set up these motion sensitive cameras. They're called, they're called camera traps or, or sometimes they're called trail cams. Um, so I will go up there and you can see here, I'm just adjusting, I'm setting, I set up the camera on a branch. That camera is gonna face down that branch that, that I've just set it up on. 
and animals will walk by uh, walk by that camera. Um, and when it does, it takes takes a picture. And we, those pictures for us as scientists are actually just data points. So um, every time an animal walks by, we uh, it'll we'll mark it market it in our in our data sheets, um, and we'll be able to get an estimation of the population of different species, um, how many of those animals there are, how many different species there are. Um, in this part of the forest that we really just don't spend a lot of time in. Um, and there, there are a lot of different species that, um, like, like Celeste said, um, some of them just sleep up in the trees, some of them will only look for food, others live their entire lives and the only way to see them is if you go up into the trees. So um, as you can imagine, um, I spend a lot of time uh, climbing, um, being very active in the kind of work that, that I'm doing, um, which is actually not all that different from how I spent my childhood. Um, I, I was a very, very active kid. Um, I did, I did gymnastics when I was, when I was younger and, um, and did that really, really, uh, intensively all the way until, uh, till I, I got older. So, um, so yeah, this, this idea of sort of getting out and being really active in the work that I get to do, um, is something that it has been really exciting and important to me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about a project uh, where I spent a year uh, split between, between two countries in the tropics. Uh, I spent half the year in Malaysia and half the year in Ecuador. Um, and these are two places that have tons and tons of biodiversity. And in particular, their, their, their forests have a lot of animals that live up in the trees. So, um, so I'm gonna start in Malaysia. Now, now Malaysia, uh, if you're not, not familiar, um, is in Southeast Asia. And uh, there's a, a portion of it that is connected to the continent of Asia. And then there's a portion of it that is on an island called Borneo. And I spent most of my time on Borneo. Um, and now one of the things that, you, that you, you notice right away when you go to these types of forests are that the canopy there is, is a really interesting shape. You, you see, uh, you can kind of see in this photo, like there are these huge trees, like you see in the in the middle, that um, that pop up above the rest, um, and then down below there is a uh, a lower, more connected canopy. So the, those trees that are down below are also pretty tall, um, and they uh, the in those trees the the crowns meet each other, and that's where you see you find a lot of animals that walk and jump and leap from one branch to the next. So this is a, um, this is a, a, a cream colored giant squirrel. Um, it's really hard to tell in this photo because um, there's not a lot of, of uh, size references, but it, uh, it's actually almost the size of a house cat. Um, they have a super, super long tail which sort of uh, helps them balance um, as they're, they're in the trees. So you can imagine, um, you can see how long that tail is. They, it, they can hang it down on one side of a branch and then reach really far to, the, to another uh, side to grab some fruit or nuts or anything that they're looking for. Um, there are also a lot of different primates or monkeys that are, that are up in the trees. Um, this is a, a, called a pigtailed macaque. Um, this is a young one with its mother behind him. Um, and as you can tell here and in these next set of photos, the animals definitely do notice the cameras. They, they can see them there. It's a little hunk of plastic that, um, that wasn't, probably wasn't there the day before. It might smell like me a little bit. Um, but we, we set up the cameras to, uh, to try, and, um, try and have them be, uh, be as uh, uh, to not be as distracting as possible. So, so they'll, they'll take a look at them, but they don't really do anything. They don't make any noise. They actually don't even have a flash on them. They'll, they have an infrared light that will go off in at night, um, but it doesn't cause like a big flash like our cameras do now. Um, uh, and as a result, they usually uh, check it out for a little while and then lose interest um, eventually. Um, this is another, the next, uh, next one is another one of my, my favorites. This is um, a uh, uh, dusky leaf monkey. Um, this is a, a type of monkey that we call la a langer. 
Um, he also noticed that Cameron has a little bit of an, an ugly smile, but he is still one of my uh, one of my favorite animals that I saw. Um, another another kind of animal that's that's up there. This one is super interesting. This is called a slow loris, um, and it's one of the only uh, venomous mammals in the world, um, or uh, poisonous mammals in the world, where uh, they they have this uh, this gland in their elbow that produces oil um, that's actually really toxic, um, and they'll mix it with their saliva. And if they get threatened, they'll they'll bite bite whatever is is attacking them. And they have this this sort of poisonous bite that's almost like getting bit by a snake. And there are not very many mammals that are capable of doing something like that, um, but it's one of their their main defenses. Um, the other thing that I was really excited about working in uh, in Southeast Asia and in Borneo in particular is that they have a ton of uh, biodiversity in terms of uh, flying squirrels. Um, flying squirrels, there, there are about uh, 30, 29 or 30 species of flying squirrels in the world and about half of them live in Southeast Asia. Um, so it's a great place to study flying squirrels if that's something you're into. Um, I definitely am. Um, and, and you remember at the beginning, I was talking about those, those big trees that stick up above the rest of the forest. Um, now these are the tallest tropical trees in the world. They, um, they can get up, up to um, around 300 feet um, or almost or 100 meters. Um, they're really, really tall. And because they stick up so high, they're perfect for an animal like a flying squirrel. Um, flying squirrels don't actually fly, they glide. So they need a really high place to jump off of so that they can glide to another place. Um, so uh, these trees provide the perfect habitat for, uh, for all of the different flying squirrel species. This is called a red giant flying squirrel. This is also, this is actually the largest squirrel species in the world, um, also around the size of a house cat. Um, and they can cover uh, the distance of a football field in one single jump, basically. So they, they climb these super, super tall trees and then they can glide for, uh, for a really, really long time to get to their next, next position. Um, yeah, this is just another one of those red giant flying squirrels. Um, there's also, there's another type of flying, uh, giant flying squirrel called a black giant flying squirrel um, that lives in almost the exact same habitat. This is actually in the same tree that you saw the first red giant flying squirrel. And this is facing down the trunk of the tree. Uh, you'll see that they'll glide and then they'll land lower on the tree and then they kind of launch themselves up the trunk of the tree so they can get higher again and glide somewhere else. Um, now in these exact same trees, we also see um, the, these really, really tiny flying squirrels. This, this one here is called a pygmy flying squirrel. Um, and it lives in the exact same, exact same forest, exact same trees sometimes. Um, and this is actually the smallest squirrel species in the world. Um, they, they weigh about 22 grams, which um, is about the, the size, uh, the weight of a double A battery, if you can imagine that. So they're really, really tiny um, and, and still use these giant trees that, um, that stick up above the rest of the forest. Um, now I could, I could keep on talking about flying squirrels forever, but I did also tell you that I'm gonna tell you about some of the animals that I saw in Ecuador as well. Now Ecuador is in South America um, and the area that I worked in uh, is uh, sort of the edge of the Amazon basin. Um, so you may have heard of the Amazon River, the Amazon rainforest. This is sort of just at the edge of that. Um, the river that, that flowed through the site I worked at goes, uh, goes in, eventually makes its way into the Amazon River. Um, and I was working in a national park called Yasuni National Park, um, which has, has actually, it's been in the news a lot um, in the last few years. Um, because there has been some uh, some construction going through there, they they are drilling for uh, for oil and and getting other natural resources outside the park and now uh, in within the boundaries of the park to some extent. So um, so there's there has been a lot of uh, a lot of research and also a lot of public attention on this park um, just to to see what the effects of all this activity is on on the species that live there. 
Um, now, I worked at a couple of different sites, some that were close to roads like this, and some that were, were really far away from anything. We actually had to get there in a boat. Um, and we see, the, we see in the, the sites that are far away from these roads, we see these um, uh, primates, these monkeys uh, that are uh, bigger, uh, have bigger bodies um, that, uh, that really uh, are, don't do well when they're close to all of that activity. So this is called a, a woolly monkey. Um, they actually get really, really kind of big and muscular. Um, and uh, this is, this is a, a younger, younger male who hasn't quite put on all of his muscle yet. Um, this next one is, is called a, a spider monkey, and they get that name because they, they have these really, really long limbs. It's sort of hard to tell in this, this photo, but his tail is super, super long. Their other arms are really long, and that's what really helps them move from branch to branch up in those trees. Um, the next one is one of my favorites. This is, this is a red, red howler monkey, and, and howler monkeys are actually, they're the loudest land mammal on earth. You can hear their call from up to um, four miles away. Um, the, actually the only species that can, uh, or the only type of animal that can be louder than that, um, that can be heard from a further distance are whales underwater. Um, but that's that's because the sound carries a little bit differently down there. Um, so the other thing that is really, really important in in the Amazon and, and also in all tropical forests is that a lot of the activity that happens uh, with the wildlife populations is actually at night. So it's really, really important that these cameras are able to document species at night. Um, like I said, it uses that infrared flash. So that's why we get these black and white pictures of uh, species like this, this woolly possum. Um, this is uh, related to the types of possums that you might see maybe in North America or something, um, but, uh, but they have, have um, their smaller, smaller body and they have a little bit different fur. Um, this is a, a two-toed sloth. Uh, you've probably, probably heard about them. They're very, very slow animals, although they're still really well adapted to the forest. So I've, I've definitely... I had one experience a few years ago where I was climbing up in a tree. I was trying to move myself a few feet in front of me. And then in the time it took me to move myself uh, a few feet with all of my ropes and gear and, and everything, um, there was a sloth that passed from one tree into my tree and onto the next. So they, we think of them as being very slow, um, but they're much faster than I am in a tree. So, um, the next one, this one is, is called a common possum. Now this one really looks like uh, the, uh, the possums that we have in, in the United States. Um, but, uh, but again, they're, they're a little bit different color, a little bit smaller. Um, the next one is, uh, this is a relative of the raccoons that we have, um, but this is called a kinkajou. Um, and kinkajous actually have a prehensile tail, which means the, their tail can be used like an arm. It can grip branches. It can hang upside down just from their tail. Um, this next one is a, oh, this is a tamandua. It's a type of anteater. So you can see him, you can see that long nose a little bit. Um, he's digging around looking for, looking for insects up in that, up in that branch. Um, and let's see, what else do we have? We have Oh, this is a uh, an owl monkey. They're sometimes called night monkeys. This is uh, actually the the only nocturnal, um, meaning it's it's only out at night. This is the only nocturnal monkey species that uh, they have in South America. Um, so you have you see they have those really really big eyes that help reflect light. That's one of their ad adaptations. Oops, that one, that is me. Um, that's me probably coming to to grab that camera. Um, let's see. Um, and this one, this is a really special one. This one might not look look uh, super interesting, but this is uh, actually really, really cool. This is called a, a bushy-tailed possum. It's very small, um, and uh, and this was actually one of the first times that this animal had been photographed in the within the national park. Um, they uh, they are are a species that is really, really rare to see. Um, and so, uh, so it was really, really exciting just to be able to collect anything on, on this. Any, uh, and that, that's the thing with studying um, animals in places that, uh, that are kind of difficult to access is any kind of 
documentation or, or discovery or, or anything that, that you, you see is something that is new and, and really fascinating and, and will, will sort of advance our knowledge about those species or that ecosystem. Um, and I should say there are plenty of reasons not to do this kind of work. It's, it's very, it's really, really hazardous in some ways. Um, there, you know, the, in the upper, upper left, you can see there were a bunch of, a bunch of bees that found me one day and they're actually drinking my sweat. So it's, it's a really hot and humid uh, forest, as you can imagine. So um, those, those bees are, are not attacking me. They're just interested in drinking all of the salt from my sweat. Um, uh, there's, uh, I've had branches uh, crack and almost fall on top of me. There's on the bottom right, there's a bunch of ants um, that have taken over one of my ropes. Um, they're in Southeast Asia, they have leeches. That's what's uh, sort of crawling in front of my face. Um, they have leeches that are on land, not just in the water, um, that are just sort of all over the place. So there are plenty of things that, that might keep you out of these forests, but um, but it is really, really important to make that kind of effort because like I said, um, the places that are really, really difficult to access um, tend to get a lot less attention. Um, and the species that are difficult to find that might be up in the trees or out at night um, are species that we tend to know very little about. So the hazards, I guess is what I'm saying, tend to be, they can be really be worth it. Um, so, um, so yeah, I just wanted to, share some of that with you. Uh, I'm really, really excited to, to answer some of your questions. Um, but, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for listening today. Um, and I guess, uh, let's see, Celeste, should I just stop my screen share? Totally. Right. Kevin, that was amazing. That was just the little dose of escapism <laughs> and excitement that I needed in this <laughs> dreary December day. Um, absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. For all of you folks out there learning along with us in classrooms and homes all over the world, we would love to see what you do with this. Parents and teachers, maybe your students end up doing a project about this, or maybe you go out and try and study your own local wildlife, a la Kevin. Uh, whatever it may be that you guys do with this, please send it to us. You can tag at Nat Geo Education on Twitter and use hashtag Explore Classroom. Your students' work is just so inspiring for all of us here at National Geographic. So we always love to see what you're up to. But Kevin is right. Now is the best time of the day. Now is question time. If you're up here on screen with me, get those nice loud voices ready. I will call on you when it's your turn. And if you're out there watching along on YouTube, please keep sending us your questions. They're really great so far. Don't forget to let us know who's asking so that we can give your students a shout out. Um, Kevin, our first question comes to us from Miss Ladon's class. Oh, here's my cat. She couldn't miss out on a wildlife event. We had to get some, <laughs> some Washington DC wildlife too. Um, Ms. Ladon's class is wondering how, about, how all of these animals interact and how they're connected with each other across their food chains. Yeah, that's a really good, uh, really, really good question. That's exactly the kind of thing that, uh, that I focus on as an ecologist. Um, so a lot of, a lot of different species um, will, will go after some of the same, the same types of research. So you can imagine there's, if you're living up in, in treetops, you might be, um, there might be a, a lot of fruit up there. Um, and so a lot of different species, if one tree is fruiting, then many different species will come there. So the best, the best time to see a lot of different species in a forest is when like a fig tree or something is in fruit. So if you just set, uh, stand under that tree or sit in the tree or set up a camera in that tree, uh, when a fig tree is producing fruit, you'll see animals come all day long and all night long. Um, and so th that, that uh, there are these big resources that can provide for a lot of different species. Um, and, uh, but it does actually also create a little bit of competition between them. And competition is a really, really important, um, important concept in, in how we think about ecosystems. There's uh, resources that are there for, for a lot of different species and they might, um, they might avoid competition from other animals by maybe only going out at night versus only going out during the day. Or maybe they will, um, they will uh, will only take fruit um, that has has gone a little bit sour or something, or maybe they are able to eat the fruit that is really really um, just not not even quite ripe yet. There are a lot of different adaptations 
um, to allow different species to take advantage of these resources in slightly different ways, um, but it, it allows a lot of different species to exist uh, at the same time. That's awesome. Thank you for that very thorough and wonderful explanation. Ms. Ladon's class hit us with a great follow-up question. They're wondering what impacts from climate change you've seen in those ecosystems. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of a lot of different things that go on. Um, the the um, for, or like uh, tropical forests in general uh, are threatened threatened in a lot of ways from climate, but also just from from development um, and uh, and extraction of resources. Like I was talking about the, the oil drilling that's that's happening there. Um, but in general, you know, I think the there it depends a lot on where where you are really where what um, what kinds of effects different um, types of forests are going to have there there we talk I talked just talked about rainforests um, sort of generally but um, but there are a lot of actually different types of rainforests that have different different amounts of, of rain that fall or different uh, types of of um, of uh, cli climate to them, and there, the thing is, like a lot of those those species that live in those places are really, really thoroughly adapted to the climate that has been there um, this whole time, and it can be really, really hard for them to adapt as as um, some of the the patterns change, temperatures change, um, and really, it's that the um, the precipitation, the rain, the amount of rain that they get is really important for that. Um, that ecosystem to survive. So changes in that um, can be really, uh, really detrimental sometimes. Awesome, thank you. Well, we've got a student in Ms. Arnone's classroom ready to go with a question. I just asked to turn on your microphone, go for it. All right, and extra loud for us, like as loud as you can be, Miss Arnold's okay. group. Yeah. Has an animal ever wrecked a camera? Oh goodness, yes, all the time, actually. Not all the time, I shouldn't say that. Uh, I think that, but yes, yeah, so um, I've, had, I've had monkeys come and they'll like shake the camera around. Um, I always have, have pictures of that. I had, you know, if you remember that, that kinkajou that I showed that has the, the tail, it can hang upside down by its tail. I had one, what I uh, got to a camera one time and I looked up in the tree and it was barely hanging onto its mount. It, it was open, all the batteries had been ripped out. And I looked at the, um, I looked at the photos afterwards and I had this sequence of photos of this kinkajou showing up, really like grabbing it with, uh, biting the camera with his mouth and then grabbing it with his, his, his claws. The thing is that because these animals are adapted to, to live and grip things up in the trees, they actually are really, really um, coordinated that they're, they have a lot of dexterity in their, their claws and in their, 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 uh, their teeth and everything. So they're, they're really good at kind of getting into things. Um, and sometimes that means my cameras. So, um, yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> sounds like they know exactly how to cause just the most frustrating <laughs> kinds of damage. Yeah. Persistence, right? Yeah, um, exactly. well, we've got a Didi out there who is wondering how you get into these super large trees. What is the process of climbing these these giant rainforest trees like for you, Kevin? Yeah, that's uh, that is another good question. Um, so, in order to get into the tree initially, I have um, actually I don't have it in the room with, with me right now. Um, I have an eight foot tall slingshot that I take out into the forest with me. Um, I put a little weight bag into that slingshot and then I tie a string to that, that weight bag and I shoot that weight bag up into the tree. Um, you know, these, some of the trees I'm climbing into are, you know, 100, 150 feet. Um, so I shoot that weight bag over a branch and that get, that'll get my string over the branch and then I will tie my rope to that string and I can pull my rope up and then I will usually tie off the rope on one end and then I'll climb up the other end or sometimes I'll tie it off up on the branch up, up top. But yeah, the, um, I, I, this is not something that I expected uh, to get a lot of skill in when I started this kind of research, but I'm actually like pretty good with a giant slingshot these days, so. 
That is amazing. I need all of the details. Does the eight foot slingshot like break into pieces? How do you get it yes, onto the plane? Yeah, yeah, that is also a good question. Um, yeah, I I used to I used to have one that broke up into two four foot pieces that I would put into a golf bag, and now I have a really fancy one that breaks into three pieces that can just go into a regular suitcase. So, um, wow. Yeah, but there's other ways. To, other other people. Some people use um, a crossbow to shoot like a really, really thin string. Um, other people will use just a bow and arrow as well. Um, that really freaked me out um, trying to learn that. Uh, it seemed seemed a little bit too challenging, also really difficult to get through customs. So um, so I stuck stuck with my slingshot, which, which doesn't look quite as, as menacing, so. I love it, so cool. Well, to continue this, this train of thought, Logan is out there wondering how long it takes you to set up all of your equipment for a climb. Oh goodness, that that is another another good question and one that really really depends. I've had um, I've had some some. I think the fastest I've ever gone from like shooting my my slingshot into the tree uh, or shooting with my slingshot into the tree, climbing up into the tree, getting my camera set up. All those things kind of take a, a bunch of time uh, and and a lot of different tries. So I think the fastest I've ever done all of that like into the tree and out of the tree. Um, is maybe two hours, um, but I've also spent three days trying to get one camera set up before. So um, I, I, I will, if, if it's taken me more than like three hours to, uh, to shoot with the slingshot into the tree, then I have to take a break, otherwise I get too frustrated. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, once you get up there, you, you get into the middle of the tree and you have to look around and see where the best branches are to set up your camera. And usually it's not the branch that you happen to be on. So once you get into the tree, uh, moving around laterally, like moving side to side um, and getting to another branch is something that is really, really hard because you're you're on this one rope that's pulling you to, to one specific place. So you have to throw another rope to another branch and pull yourself in that direction. It, it gets really, really difficult to move yourself around up in the tree. So it takes a lot of time. Um, and, uh, and yeah, yeah, it can, it can, it, it can take a while, basically. So. All right. Well, let's visit another on screen student. We've got Freya with us. Go for it. Freya, what's your question? Okay, so my question is, is there an a animal or plant that you want to see that you haven't encountered yet? Oh man, yeah, no, that that's that's a really good question. I would say, um, in in terms of seeing things in real life, it's actually so it, it's actually pretty rare for me to see animals while I'm in the tree, um, just in the tree in the trees with me. Um, I you know I'm I'm like a big weird thing that they're not used to seeing. So uh, even if they are in those trees when I get there, they're usually gone by the time I get up, I get up there. Um, so I really any animal that I see out in the forest is really special um, and really exciting. Um, and uh, in terms of animals that I would want to to get on the cameras, um, man, gosh, there's there are always always species that uh, that I think I might be able to get that that I won't. Well, one of my one of my favorites is uh, a, a, a type of of porcupine. Um, in, in Central America, like in, in Panama, where I've, I've worked before, I've seen a bunch of them, but in the Amazon, I haven't seen any of them. Um, and so I, I have, in addition to really loving flying squirrels in Southeast Asia, I also really love porcupines. Um, so I would really love to see some porcupines on my, my Ecuador cameras one day. Um, so I think that's probably, probably what I'll say for that. Awesome. Well, we've got Anna Aya from Miss Becker's class wondering if you've ever been bitten by an animal or otherwise injured as a part of your job. Um, I have uh, I have not been bitten by like any of the animals that you saw from the camera traps. I get bit all the time by ants and other insects. Um, I, there, there are a lot of ants, so there are some trees, especially fig trees, like I was talking about before, that have, um, have a really unique relationship with ants, where the, the figs will, or the, the tree will produce all this fruit that the ant, and the ants will live in the tree itself. Um, but in, in return, the ants will defend that tree from anything that comes into it. So I had one experience where I was climbing up 
into the tree and then I set my foot onto a branch and the moment that I, and my foot hit that branch there were just hundreds of ants that crawled up my leg and into my pants and into my shirt and everything so I got bit so many times I couldn't even count um but uh but yeah there are a lot of a lot of uh a lot of sort of um bugs like that like ants or ticks or 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 um, leeches, all kinds of things. So yes, I, I don't get bit by, by like, you know, big teeth, like the kinds of things you might be thinking of, but I do get bit a lot, so. What a cool answer. <laughs> all right, we've got Mr. Holiday's class with us. Mr. Holiday, what kind of questions do you folks have? Yes, um, does anybody in my class, um, we have Liam with us and Lawrence and Josiah and Isa. Kayla and Addie, do any of you have any questions? Please unmute or raise your hand and let Celeste know. I see Addie with a question. I just asked to turn on your microphone. Very good. Well, um, my question is, um, in class, we're kind of talking about um, the pygmy marmoset monkeys. And I was wondering if you've seen any of those like in the, in the forest that you put cameras up and stuff. You know, I haven't seen a pygmy marmoset specifically, but uh, what I have seen, uh, I have seen a couple of their relatives. There's another another animal or another species um, that uh, is called a, a tamarin, um, which is really really closely related to uh, to marmosets. Um, so I've seen a bunch of those in. Um, in uh, in Panama, which was the, one of the first places that I, I ever did any of this this uh, canopy work, um, and then um, and there there are another there's another another monkey that is not not as closely related as the tamarin, but they're about the same size that are called squirrel monkeys, and they they really like run around in these big groups of of animals. Um, and uh, uh, these really big, big groups. Um, and so those are, those are the two kind of really smaller monkeys that I think of when I think of, uh, think of you guys studying, studying the marmosets, so. Awesome, well, we've got Baruch in the YouTube chat bar wondering if you work by yourself or is there a whole team of scientists? What's your normal setup, Kevin? Also a very good question. Um, yeah, I am never out in the forest by myself. Um, there, there's just so many things that can go wrong um, and you, you definitely wanna have at least one, if not more uh, people there that, you know, sometimes I have people that are up in the tree with me that, and we're both setting up cameras. Other times I have someone that just comes out and they're, they're on the ground so that they know where I am if something happens. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so sometimes it's, it's a small group of people, sometimes it's just two of us, but, um, but yeah, I definitely, definitely use the buddy system um, when I go out into the forest because you just never know what, what can happen and you want somebody else around um, to kind of get you out of a, a situation if you need to. Absolutely. And we've got James out there asking the, asking the pragmatic questions. James is wondering how much does a rainforest expedition cost? Uh, that also a very, very good question. Um, I think uh, it, uh, yeah, it depends on where you're going. Um, uh, plane tickets, like when I first started working working um, uh, in the tropics, uh, plane I discovered that plane tickets to Panama were much cheaper than tickets to Malaysia um, from where I am. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's the travel cost, it's um, staying at, uh, I usually am staying at research stations that are off in the forest, and it costs a lot of money for them to continue to operate, so I, I have to pay pay my way through through there. And then, yeah, then it's a lot of sort of specialized weird equipment. Ropes cost a couple hundred dollars. That slingshot, um, that slingshot is a couple hundred dollars. Lots of... Um, and then the the gear that you use to actually um, get yourself up into the tree and the the, the harness, all of that is, gets expensive. And um, and uh, and the cameras themselves. Yeah, one of those cameras that I use um, costs about five hundred dollars. So um, so yeah, it, you can imagine it. Of uh, uh, it gets expensive pretty quickly. So that's also why. I will um, collaborate with other researchers. Maybe uh, someone someone has some of the equipment that I need. I might have some of the equipment that they need. So we'll work together to share those resources, um, or uh, or yeah, things like that. So. 
absolutely. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> well, we've got another question in Ms. Arnone's classroom. Go for it, folks. Nice and loud. How many species can be found on your campus? Oh, man. Um, I don't know if I've counted up everything in total. I think uh, in each of the different places, uh, like in Panama and in Ecuador and in um, in Malaysia, I think in each of those places I, I was getting maybe like 20 to 30 different mammal species. Um, and then, um, and then, you know, like some, some of them you see, uh, like you'll see, you'll see maybe get maybe one photo of that like bushy tailed possum, but you'll get, you know, a thousand photos of, of, um, I don't know, a night monkey, an owl monkey that, that just really likes to hang out in front of the camera. So it's not, you're not always getting lots of, lots of photos of lots of different things. You might get one photo out of thousands of one species and then a whole like, you know, hundreds of photos of, of one other species. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, we've got Isa from Mr. Holiday's class with a burning question. I'm gonna ask to turn on your microphone, Isa, go for it. Have you ever fallen out of a tree? Oh man, um, that is a really terrifying question. Um, I I have come close. Um, there was one point, um, one point where it is it, honestly, I, I, I I'm smiling about it now, but it is one of the things that I I literally do have nightmares about because you can you know when you're up in the tree, you're you're doing a lot of different things at once, um, but at the you know, there is this one, one really important thing, this rope that is keeping you, you up there. Um, and if you, you make mistakes, sometimes, you know, I've, I've like sl slipped or dropped something or whatever, and all of that is really, really um, makes me nervous. Um, but there are like little things, points where you have to take yourself off the rope and attach yourself to a different rope or something. And those those moments are you really really have to focus hard um, because uh, one mistake can really really be be uh, pretty devastating. Um, and the other thing is like a lot like a lot of the trees that I'm climbing in, nobody else has climbed in them before. Nobody there's no like no like uh, like. Uh, um, safety committee that comes out and assesses everything. It's it's me that's coming out and and looking at the tree, looking at the health of the tree. Do I do my own safety inspection um, and and everything? So uh, so I do as much as I can. But ultimately, these are these are wild trees out out in the forest. So you never really know what's going to happen. And I I did have one experience where. I, I got myself into the tree. I, I started climbing up my rope. I got maybe 15 feet up. And then all of a sudden I heard a crack and uh, and then I was six feet off the ground. So I had just dropped, uh, dropped maybe 10 feet or so. Um, and I it wasn't that the branch that I was on had broken. The, the branch I was on, uh, that my rope was on was, was, was uh, was strong enough, but it was leaning. There was another branch that my rope leaned against as it came down that I couldn't see, and that branch um, had had rotted away a little bit. Um, and the weight, uh, like my weight leaning, uh, uh, the weight of me on my rope leaning against it was enough to break it off, and it fell. It fell, and luckily got caught on another branch as it came down. Otherwise, um, otherwise it would have fallen right on top of me. So, um, so yeah, it is. It uh, you know, it's. It's something that I I do everything in my power to to be as safe as possible. But um, but yeah, mistakes can happen, and just things that that you can't control um, happen out there all the time. Awesome. Well, we've got another on screen student with us. We've got Martina joining from California. Go for it, Martina. I just asked to turn on your microphone. What do sloths eat? Sloths? Oh, that's a, that's a, a very good question. So sloths um, are are mostly herbivorous, which means they uh, they mostly eat leaves. Um, uh, so they and and actually, it's not even just any leaves. They really like going after uh, the young younger leaves on um, on a tree. So um, when uh, when there are are like some of the the leaves that are just coming out, that's those are the kinds of of uh, leaves that they they like to go after um, 
but uh, but yeah, they they are mostly mostly eating plants is what they they eat. So. Awesome. Well, we've got Owen and Karendi out there wondering about ecology. They're each wondering what got you into it and why this kind of science. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, you know that that's another another really good question. Um, I think part of it was uh, that I I knew that I liked. I, I always was somebody that really enjoyed animals. Um, I, I actually, when I was a kid, I grew up in Minnesota, um, so very far from the tropics. Um, and I think I think growing up in a cold place made me want to go to a warm place, maybe. But also, um, I um, I grew up really close to the Minnesota Zoo, which has a really really um, a, a lot of really amazing. Um, um, uh, displays and, uh, and a lot of really interesting educational programs. So I, I was really uh, exposed to a lot of wildlife through that. And then when I got to, uh, when I got to college, the university, um, I, I think I, I just, I met other graduate students. I met some professors that were doing interesting work. I actually, as a, when I was in college and for my master's degree, I was actually studying marine biology. Um, and it wasn't until I started my PhD that I started doing anything in forests at all. So um, I, 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 early on, I think I was meeting people that I thought were doing really interesting work and then asking if I could work with them. Um, and that was, that was how I kind of got started um, doing things in, uh, in marine science. And then, um, and then yeah, I, I, I started off just, uh, I, was I was really fortunate in graduate school to be able to go and do a sort of internship with, uh, with at a, a research station in Panama. And I just really enjoyed being at that station and I wanted an opportunity to go back. Um, and so that's what I, uh, what I, I decided to do. Um, I mean, the, the, the way that I started thinking about canopy work in general was uh, I, I was out in the forest setting up these cameras on the ground. I was helping out another researcher uh, like I had done. And I set it up and then just as we, we we set it up, there was a, a, an anteater, the tamandua, like you saw, that crawled through the trees all like way, way up above the camera we had just set up. And that, that, that moment is kind of what got me thinking about all the species that we miss by only focusing on um, focusing cameras in, in places that are convenient for us to, to, to be. So I was like, well, it looks like, it looks like I, gotta, I gotta learn how to climb a tree now. So, um, so yeah, that was sort of how what kicked all of that off, I guess. So, so wonderful. All right, well, Kevin, for our last question, do you have any advice for all the young explorers out there with us today? Yeah, you know, I think um, kind of related to what I was I was just talking about is I I even though I grew up um, like in the suburbs in Minnesota. Um, really, really far and different from the places that I ended up doing, doing a lot of my research. Um, I, I found out a lot about the environment and about uh, wildlife and about ecosystems starting there. So um, wherever you actually are now, um, there are, there's a lot of really, really, even if you're in the city, if you're out in a rural area, there's a lot of really interesting life happening everywhere. Um, and, and doing the things that, that allow you to sort of um, feed your curiosity a little bit, you know, walking, walking through any forest or any park or whatever, it, like there are lots of things that I don't know about those places. And I'm sure there's lots of things that you don't know. Um, and there's, uh, we're fortunate right, uh, right now that like m now more than ever, it's, it's really easy to find out something about those things. So you can take a picture, you can look it up. You, there are all sorts of apps where you can just point your phone at a, a leaf and it'll tell you what kind of tree it is and stuff. There's lots of lots of ways to learn. Um, and I think, you know, for me, it really just started by being curious about things and finding people that um, that I thought were really interesting and impressive um, and, and just asking to if I could learn from them, so. Absolutely wonderful advice. Well, Kevin, this has been so much fun. Thank you. Thank you times a million. Um, thank you to all of our teachers for making cool events like this happen. Thank you to all of our students for your super thoughtful questions. Today was a blast. You can all check out uh, Explore Classroom plus many, many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. I hope to see you at some of our upcoming events. 
Later today at two o'clock Eastern time, we're going to be talking about life in the ice in Antarctica. That'll be really fun. Uh, on Monday, Kevin's coming back to talk to younger students. So if you have any friends in pre-K through second grade, you should definitely tell them all about it. And this time next week, we're gonna be connecting with explorers who've dedicated their lives to preventing extinction. So we're gonna focus on lemurs and tapirs, pretty cool species to come learn about. I wanna wish everyone a very happy first night of Hanukkah and a great holiday season. One last reminder that Explorer Classroom will go on our winter break after the end of our events next week. And now it's that time you guys have been so thoughtful and patient and reserved and quiet. Let's go ahead and turn on everyone's microphones and just get super, super loud. Let's scream goodbye and thank you to Kevin on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three, three.